Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 167 for Monday, May 28th, 2018. folks and welcome to gig gab the podcast by for and about working musicians and lots of moving microphones here in durham new hampshire i'm dave hamilton here in las gatas california it's paul kent moving a lot of microphones how you doing paul good you're cracking yourself up over there i sure am that's that's what what we what we do right <laughs> Now you're cracking me up. There you go. There you go. Hey, uh, while we're here, first, welcome everyone to GigGab. And we would like to welcome more of you to GigGab. So if you know of some musicians, if you are members of a group of musicians, just tell your tell your musician friends or your music loving friends like the people. We have a lot of listeners uh, you might be one of them that uh, that kind of like our little peek behind the curtain here. Because you're a music fan and and you don't necessarily see this because we try to hide it when we're on stage. <laughs> so, uh, you know, tell anybody that you think might be interested. GigGabPodcast.com or, you know, um, GigGabPodcast.com slash Facebook or subscribe. Yeah, we've got this. Tunes. Yeah, whatever. We've got this cool community worldwide of people who are listening to the show. It's really fun for us. We love doing it and uh, we want to keep doing it, but we want to get it out to a bigger audience. So if you know anybody who think would enjoy listening to two guys rant about planning a band, pass us along. Yeah. Yeah. There you go, man. Uh, I've had a busy week, Paul. So we're, we're actually recording this because it's Memorial day and who knows what's going to be going on in our family lives and all that stuff on Monday. Uh, we're recording this on Friday, but, um, it's been a crazy week. So I had another madhouse this week, which, uh, generally is, is costs me two day, two afternoons. And, and one of those afternoons spills into the evening performance. Uh, and that's usually Monday and Wednesday with a Wednesday performance. And that certainly happened this week. What also happened this week is that on Thursday, my daughter's high school opened her production of Grease and I'm playing drums for it. And that meant that Tech Week, i.e. daily rehearsals, uh, load in happened on Sunday and then Tech Week started on Monday. And so you can imagine my uh, initial dismay a few months ago when I looked at the calendar and thought, oh, huh. How's this going to work? So I, wor I worked with my my, you know, bandmates in Madhouse, of which there are, you know, 20 or so. And then uh, and then, of course, the the music director and, and director of, of Greece and said, OK, let me know. You know, Madhouse can be somewhat f flexible. You know, Madhouse was the thing that got to be more flexible this week than Greece. Like, what are you thinking for rehearsals? And so it, it was I, and I have been in this situation before. And have not handled it as well as I did this week. The first time I just told the director of the musical, hey, I'm going to be out like all day Wednesday, which is your final dress rehearsal. That's the problem. Opening Thursday night, not being there Wednesday. Not so good. Right. Um, but uh, and, and that that actually caused me to lose that first gig. <laughs> so uh, this time I wanted to do both. And so I reached out and I said, hey, I have this thing. I want to do both. You know, I'm I, I'm it's sort of integral to this madhouse thing. It's really important for me to do this grease thing, which, of course, I'm volunteering my time for because I'm a parent. And I, I said, but, I, you know, I want to do both, you know, and and so it, it took some negotiating and moving and shoving. And then suddenly I found myself in the middle of some other power struggle that had nothing to do with me. It was like, oh, crap. But in, in the end, it all worked out. But it was definitely uh uh, uh, the procedure was something that I learned from doing the wrong way with with a different director back in the in the fall when when I was in a similar scenario. So uh, so it worked. But what it meant was on Sunday, I loaded my drums in to uh, into the theater for Greece. And then on Monday morning, I loaded a different set of drums into the theater for Madhouse and then rehearsed Madhouse like one to five or something on Monday afternoon, raced from there to the high school where we rehearsed Greece from, you know, <laughs> six, 630 until whatever, 10 or something. 
And then Tuesday was my quote unquote easy rehearsal day because I only had one rehearsal and that was Greece. I don't know, like four in the afternoon until whatever time we finished, like eight or something. And then Wednesday was the trick because the music director for Greece really didn't want me to miss the final rehearsal. And I, yeah, and I get that now from my standpoint, it, and she agreed with this. It, it, that that rehe- me attending that rehearsal had nothing to do with me. Like I knew this show. I played it actually the, the last time. The only time I've ever, ever played it was when I was a junior in high school. So I get to relive my high school experience here. <laughs> <laughs> but at least which is whatever. Have- doesn't everybody want that? Doesn't everybody want? Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, but uh, at least I'm not doing it vicariously through my daughter. I'm just doing it <laughs> alongside of my daughter. Yeah. Oh. Um. But, uh, you know, for the cast, for the benefit of the cast and everything, uh, like, you know, you want a drummer there because it's a rock musical. It's like it's kind of important. So it's like, okay, fine. So we did with Madhouse. There's some people that can only rehearse day of of the show, like, you know, a singer here, a singer there. And there were other things we needed to do. We we usually use the full day um, on the day of the show. So I went to Madhouse from one until three, where we were really super productive because everybody knew we had a deadline. So that was actually a really good thing. And it taught us that we can probably be a little more efficient in our process. But uh, and then from there, I raced to the high school for a rehearsal that started at four, finished that rehearsal at six, raced back to the Madhouse Theater. And uh, and we rehearsed a little bit from like seven to seven thirty. And then, you know, the curtain was at eight. Um, So it was it was a crazy day. The weird part was, of course, I'm doing Grease, so it's all this, you know, 50s music. And then just by happenstance, this madhouse was one that they called a tribute to the king. So it was 80 percent Elvis songs. <laughs> and then and then there were some Michael Jackson songs and some other, you know, King songs in there. And, and they, it's, you know, they always the, the Mad Men always string together. A king Crimson. You know, I asked if if we could play King Crimson and, and they looked at me <laughs> like I was crazy. Uh, <laughs> but it, it meant it was it is a week of all 50s music. And during Madhouse, that that caught me a little bit because I've been playing so many different 50s songs and they're all so darn similar in yeah. their grooves that, you know, there was one song I couldn't hear the guitar. I was it was a song where I did not start it. It was a monkey business, right? From uh, from Elvis. And it, mm-hmm. it it was like in my head now, I can sing the song and I can hear it. But in the midst of, you know, 50 other 50s songs that were swimming in my head, especially on that particular day, I just couldn't hear the tune. But I didn't worry about it because the guitar player was going to start it. And I knew that. So I, I hadn't like normally I'll make notes to myself like uh, like we played uh, the the Elvis Egypt song. And I can't remember the name of the, the tune. But when I as soon as I heard it, the first thing that popped into my head was, oh, it's Steve Martin's King Tut. So I write that in my script so, <laughs> so that I have like some reference where I know like, OK, yeah, if I just play that groove then I know we're going to be close, you know? So I did not do that for monkey business and we got to it in the set and it was like, yeah, okay, well, Nick's going to start it. Great. And Nick did start it. And I have no doubt that Nick played the right part, but on that song, he chose to switch to an acoustic guitar, which for whatever reason was not in my monitor. And it was like, I have no idea what Nick's playing. Like I can see his hand, but nothing. Yeah. And, and so it, thankfully the singer, like the first half of the first verse was a mess. And then the singer got to the point where he sings the, uh huh, too much monkey biz. And, and it was like, Oh, <laughs> right. That's the song. Great. That one. That, that one. one. Yeah. And, and then we were in and it was like all good. So, um, which is fun. Like I like those moments. I would prefer them not to have to happen because they're my fault, but you know, whatever. Um, it all, it all worked, but Something interesting happened. So that in and of itself is all interesting. Uh, at least it was to me having to live it. But, you know, you, you know, I've, I've talked on this show about my superstitions before, Paul, where I, 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 I have my routines for the gig. And I know that if I follow my routines, you know, they'll, they'll be good. And a lot of my superstitions are rooted in Murphy's Law. You know, I always joke that Murphy is on my speed dial. And yep. uh, and so I do my best to avoid those. And there are two things that I've talked about on the show several times that I do. One is that I bring two bass drum pedals to every gig because repairing a bass drum pedal mid, even mid evening, mid, you know, on a set break would be nearly impossible. You know, there's just too many moving parts right. and, and it's a critical part of the kit, right? If I lost a hi-hat pedal, it would suck. 
but I could easily make it through a gig without a hi-hat, you know, but kick drum, like rock band, you need. So always two kick pedals at the gig. And for this one, sure enough, as I was leaving the Grease Theater, I grabbed my my pedal that I normally use. My other one was in the car, as it always is, for gigs. And so I had two. But I did not bring another snare drum with me to Madhouse. Oh. Now, I knew what I was doing. Like, I was, I was aware of this. And I looked at my snare in, in, in the grease pit as I was leaving and thought, now, nah, you know what? I'm fine. Like, it's going to be fine. <laughs> Famous last words. Yeah. But it, there's going to be like there was another snare drum in the house. Um, there's a uh, at the same theater that we do Madhouse. Uh, is a run of the producers. And so Chris, the drummer for that, his snare drum's there. Now, obviously I would prefer not to just have to steal his snare drum off his kit and use it, but worse comes to worse. Like he would understand, I, you know, I would understand in the same scenario. It's fine. So it was like, okay, there is another snare drum in the building. Fine. Um, so we get to the gig and we're doing the gig and the first set goes fine. And the second act is fine. And we, um, uh, jailhouse rock was the last two, it was the like fourth to last song. We had three songs after that. So we finished jailhouse rock and, uh, we start the next tune, which was, um, uh, it wasn't man in the mirror. It was, uh, it was one of these Michael Jackson tunes anyway. And I start the tune and it's like, what's going on. And I look <laughs> down and there is this, it's not just a broken head. It is a tear. It's a, yeah. this head is destroyed. It's like, Oh my God. And, uh, I, you know, this, so now, even if I had a spare snare drum, there was no time in the way this show was paced for me Could to have, get it in, for me to yeah. have gotten it in, unless it was literally sitting next to me on stage. And even then maybe not. Right. But, um, but it was not uh, with me on stage. In fact, it was, you know, two towns over. Chris's snare drum was was far enough away that it wasn't going to happen. So I I turned the drum and actually just played rim shots on the on like a part of the head that wasn't destroyed. And it wasn't nearly as loud, which might have made the sound guy even happier. So uh, so it all worked, you know, and nobody actually nobody, even people in the band didn't realize what had happened until, you know, after we finished the night. And it was like, oh, yeah, look. Um, but it is the first time in 20 years that I've broken a uh, snare drum head. And also the first time in 20 years that I have not brought two snare drums to the gig. So laugh at me all so, you want about my superstitions. Pa paging Mr. Murphy. Yes. Paging Mr. Murphy. Yeah, man. So, hey, you know that. Go ahead. That ability to improvise at the moment is a fascinating thing to me. My bass player uh, breaks bass strings like nobody I've ever seen before. Wow. Right. Yeah, he's got these short, stubby fingers and he he plucks really hard and he breaks bass strings. Now, the, the, in and of, of itself, that's a weird thing. Yeah. But this cat is so I mean, he's just a brilliant guy. He works his way around the broken string and sometimes it's with Tower Power songs. So, yeah, no, it's unbelievable to see in real time. Like I'll look over at him. And um, I'll see the, the broken string dangling there. And either he's already got it figured out and he gives me the nod, or I see him planning a strategy in real time and then implementing a strategy in real time. It is the most remarkable thing to see, but he just works around, you know, he just works around the, yeah. the broken string. Yeah. He knows his instrument and he, I mean, that's, that's insane by the way. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 But, but I'm sure in his mind, it's like, Oh cool. A challenge, you know, like I got to deal with this. So that's yeah. Steve. Yeah. That's Steve. Yeah. 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 Do you remember what you must have done to break the head? I mean, it was an old, head that was due to get replaced anyway Did, were you smacking it pretty hard i mean what was going on well it, it was the I, I assume it was the last hit of like the big ending of jailhouse rock so big rock uh. ending and then pop but um I, I mean this head shouldn't have broken it it was a um a single ply head but with a power dot underneath to both dry out the head and give it some support and and so i tried to figure like afterwards i'm like what possibly could have happened here and I realized that the tip of my one of my drumsticks had gotten like cut. So it, it had a sharp edge on it. Yeah, I think it was just like, you know, perfectly. It was the perfect storm of a big, powerful hit with a knife edge on the on the stick. You know, that'll do it. That'll do it. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. 
<laughs> yeah, because yeah, I just wow. don't break heads. I don't break symbol. I mean, geez, I got to find some wood to knock on here. But um, it's just not <laughs> something that happens often to me. But clearly it can happen. So, yeah, yeah be, pro- oh, you know, and, and it's funny because people laugh at me. They're, they're like, God, you're such a Boy Scout. I'm like, well, actually, yeah, I am. Like, I, you know, I, I didn't quite make it to Eagle. If something goes wrong, it's not going to be me. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm always be we say always be performing. Well, you know, part of that is always, always be, prepared. be prepared. Yeah, yeah exactly. for sure. Yeah. <laughs> So it was, it was um, you know, you made it through. I made it through and I brought a third snare because I haven't replaced the head on that one yet. Um, I, I brought a, a different snare drum with me to the theater last night and that sat in my car while we uh, while we opened Greece because <laughs> nice and comfortable. Yeah, because I know. better. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, I want to talk about um, a little bit adding on that conversation we had last week about um whether you take the gigs in advance or whether, you know, whether you hit a certain point where it's worth waiting for the, for the best paying opportunity. And I just want to talk a little bit about, about uh, an observation I have from talking to some friends of mine about that particular thing um, about setting prices and, and, you know, leverage and all that type of stuff. So the, the anecdotes are, um, well, the premises you have to believe you're worth something in order to move the universe towards that number. So yes. if you're, if you take a hundred dollar gigs, $50 gigs and you complain about them, but you know, that's, you're willing to keep taking them uh, and not raise your price and not kind of get into the, get into the game of negotiating price. You're going to get what you're offered, right? Absolutely. If you, I, you have to believe the price that you're selling for. That's true. Like that's just sales one oh one. Yep. Not only sales, it's kind of like, you know, uh, 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 metaphysics 101, right? If you want to really move is. the universe in a certain direction, yeah. you know, you're going to have to have a, a, a place where you want to go. And so so I think that that's important. And, and from what I understand, we've asked this question to listeners in the past and they've uh, shared, you know, club rates are about, you know, 100 bucks a man is kind of average. 200 bucks a man for a club date is pretty good, you yeah. know, regardless of the size of the band, that type of thing. And so, you know, I think most of us in the U.S. are in a, in a fairly similar place. Like, you know, not too many working musicians will go out for less than 100 bucks. There has to be a pretty good reason to do it. Yep. And, and there are those reasons, by the way, Ab- but, um, all all over the place. That's right. Yeah, right. Good cause. And, right gig. But but right gig. Actually, I would I would put an asterisk on that and come back to it because I because you can convince yourself that anything's the right gig. That's that's a different conversation, though. Yeah. But generally, that one hundred to two hundred per man yep. is 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 the range that most people are working. Uh, club dates, you know, and and often, you know, even there's the casual market that goes down. Although the casual market should be a lot higher. So. My premise was I have I have some really great places I play that pay me really well. Yep. And my premise is those cannot be the only places that pay really well. So my it's job not, is to go out. It's not an accident that that you're that you're playing those either. So yeah, I've I've earned my way into them, and I've delivered the goods in terms of I think a, you know a really solid show and a good audience when I go to these places. So, um, but I know, like I said, I can't have all the gigs of those good paying ones. There's got to be more out there. Part of my job is to go out and find the ones that pay well and be really cautious about the ones that don't pay well. Yep. And. And so that's that's part of the game is like, you know, advancing the universe in the direction of the better paying gigs um, is one of the deals with it. Now, I have two um, stories here. So one is um, a friend of mine plays at a local winery that is not a great paying one on the lower part of the scale. And they love her and she does great work. And um, and uh, she got asked to do a. I would call it a casual kind of a celebration thing. And she asked what the pay is. And the response was, it's the same as, as you know, your, your regular dates here. And she was like, Oh, that's, that's not okay. And so she basically said, that's not okay. They came back and said, okay, well, how about some more? So just in that, I just want to raise to the surface. Everything is negotiable. And I know with a lot of people who are not comfortable in negotiation, the concept of negotiation feels like a confrontational thing, but I do believe that that premise, you'll never get what you want. If you don't ask is, uh, is, is in play just about all the time. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. Just about all the time. Certainly you have those scenarios where you just fall in with dumb luck, but, uh, but don't take credit for those take them, but don't take credit for them. You know, use them. And and the flip side, there's a very small percentage of people who will get offended. If you ask them, I would say it's, it's, 
it's less than 10% of the types of deals that you'll get into, you know, even up to club, they may say, no, 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 you know, our pay is our pay. You know, we get it. We'd love to pay you more or whatever it is. You will find the, the couple of people who are on some kind of a power trip who don't even want to have the conversation and it might be a relationship breaker, but I guess you'd have to ask the question, is that the relationship you want to be in anyway? Right. Yeah. How, how important is a gig? Right. right. So another uh, uh, point you're talking about the dumb luck that you just stumble into a duo that I know got asked to do a private party. They were asked what the price was. They said a thousand bucks for a duo. The guy said, great. <laughs> and, and signed them up. And again, it's the point is you're not going to advance the ball. You're not going to, you're not going to change the playing field. If you don't start pushing for these things, asking for more, having pleasant conversations, being picky about the gigs that you take, um, being picky about, uh, the gigs that you reject, you know, again, you know, what are you going to say no to? I have a, uh, a friend who's a pro musician who, uh, any night working is better than a night not working. That's another, you know, hundred, 200 bucks in his pocket, but he won't take a lesser paying gig until within a week or two, where it's clearly not likely he's going to book it with something else. Sure. Right. Expiring inventory. Right. Exactly. It's, it's, it's an airline seat, right? Yep. It's an airplane yep. seat. Like once that day is gone, you never have a chance to make that revenue again. Yep. But I think the, the whole point of this is um, you have to, if you're of the mindset, well, you'll just take what people give you. You'll get what people give you. You have to be a willing participant in changing the playing field. And that is seeking out the better playing gigs. And again, you know, the, the, the given in all this is that you're going to deliver the goods, whatever the goods are. You're, you're a great player. You've developed a great audience. Both of those types of things. You'll make the venue more money, those types of things. And, you know, once you've developed that audience, you know, I would like to think that the same energy you've put into developing your audience gets channeled into taking advantage of it and saying, Hey, look, you know, I'm doing more than anybody else is doing for you. Mr. Venue owner, Mrs. Yep. Venue owner, you know, I think it's fair. And you know what you're going to find out that there is a conversation. Does that business owner want to let that business go because you're bringing in people? Um, does that business owner not want to set a precedent that he's willing to pay if someone else does it? I would think again, you put, you put yourself in, in their shoes. If someone's making me money, there's a point at which, you know, I'm willing to share the upside with that with them for them to continue making me money versus I can go out and get the $50 guy or the $100 guy. You know, there's a point at which, but in there is a conversation and being willing to have that conversation is where it all starts. You have to view, you have to, A, like you said, value your service. B, you have to be willing to represent the value of that service and, you know, go after what you want. And I believe, you know, just hearing these stories from my friends and, you know, they, a lot of the people who listen to Gig Gab that I know have really reacted favorably to like, yeah, you know, there's more money out there. What we do is a value. Um, we What we often do is we we make people money and we're more progressive about it than many other people. So in that realization, you know, we're going to see how how much we can tilt the leverage in our in our favor. Right. You know, if, well, if I'm that, if I'm that that's an if you, you've said it a couple of times, you know, we're making these club owners or venue or whatever it is, we're making you money. And, and for club gigs, that's the, that's the paradigm, right? Is they've got a profit uh, that they need to, or a, a, a number they need to hit. And can you help them beat that? And if you can, can you convince them to let you share in the Delta, right? <laughs> you know, they, they, whatever, whatever the night's going to cost them is X. If uh, Y is what they make and Y is more than X. And you can point to, I contributed to making Y higher than Y would have been. Well, then yes, you sh like on uh, looking at it without emotion and, and just logically, it totally makes sense that smart business per person would uh, would include you in in those spoils. Now, you know, depending on what the percentage is, that's where negotiation comes from. Right. But yep. you, you need to go into that conversation uh, with your with your ducks in a row. You need to know that, yes, I am making you money or you need to at least <laughs> you need to believe it. And you need to be able to present it as though it's obvious and in a in a very kind of cohesive way. If you're not making that person extra money, then that's going to be a much you don't have leverage. You, you, you'd have less leverage. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yep. But if you do and again, there's there's all sorts of part of it. There's the part where, you know. I, I'll give you an example. I'm paying I'm playing a hotel tonight. 
Um, it's not on us to bring a draw in. Right. 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 And the pay and the pay is the pay. So in that situation where we're not valued, I mean, although I would say if we do make them money, they'll notice, but that's not, you know, we didn't get the gig based upon our ability to bring in additional revenue. It's a service to the people staying at this that's hotel. They, they, they just, however, you're a cog in the wheel of their system. Yep. However, you know, if, if, if I bring a crowd and, you know, they'll notice that type of thing, although it was not an expectation, but it's an interesting thing. It pays fine. The question is, you know, at what point in time can we say, Hey, you know, you know, I do this kind of for a living and, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's four hours, you know, between getting up there, performing, getting home, you know, can we have a discussion about getting the pay scale up? Yeah. It'll be interesting to see again, they may say no. And they may say like, listen, you know, we just do it to stick the music in the corner and that's all that we really want out of it. Right. I'm yeah. not, I'm not going to bank on the musicians to make me more money. I'm not going to not bank on it, but you know, so right now there's not any leverage. I, it'll be an interesting exercise to see where this goes after a bit of time about trying to get that pay scale up. But the point in all this is, well, well we, you go get to your point. And then I have, actually, I want to revisit that because there might be leverage, but go ahead. Yeah. I, my premise is, is that there is better money always to be made for a good musician, right? Well, um, that's it. Yeah. And, and that's the leverage that you have, even for this hotel gig, right? Is you might be able to say to them, look, it, you know, like, here's the hourly thing. I do this for a living, like set the foundation for the, why you want to have this conversation. Okay, great. And then it's look, you know, I know you don't need me to bring a crowd. So that's not really part of our equation here. And that's fine. No problem. You know, it's nice to not have to worry about that. I appreciate it. But you know, I show up, I make sure I'm professionally dressed. I'm playing songs that your people like. I am, you know, if you you just want music in the corner that is just in the corner music, I am respectful of that. And I keep the volume and the types of songs to be the kind of thing that are kind of going to be wallpaper. I mean, what, you know, whatever it is that person Sell your asset. Sell, buying, sell your upside. Yeah, well, and sell what they want to buy. Right. Yeah. Is the, is the key because because th like you could have you could literally play the same songs at a different place and sell it completely differently than that. But if that's what they want, then say, look, you know, and I, and and, you know, I need a little more money because of these things and it's my living and I've got other gigs that would pay me more. But I you know, I, I want to offer this to you first, essentially giving them right of first refusal, you know, but in a potentially softer way. Um, and, and implying that, you know, not everyone that you hire, certainly there's other people that'll be able to do this and that's great, but not everyone. And you've already got a winning formula here. Can we work together and find a way to make this, you know, more mutually, uh, beneficial? I refer you to the, the brilliant professor, Billy Joel, who wrote in the early seventies, it's a pretty good sa crowd for a Saturday. And the manager gives me a smile because he knows that it's me. They've been coming to see to forget about life for a while. There it is. Yeah. It's all laid out there. It's all laid out. That's it. There's your, and you know what? If you actually just say those words, just like the esteemed Mr. Kent did, that might just get you more money. Technically the esteemed Mr. Joel. Well, no, you, no, but if you say them the way you just did, right? Yeah. Like he sang them, you say them, like quote them to the manager and, uh, and that might actually get you more money. So like there you it. go. I like it. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Here's an interesting thing to talk about. Okay. Tough conversations. Okay. So, you know, we think of our bands and, you know, it's, it's our buddies. It's, it's our, it's either our buddies who we recruited to do this together or it's people who become buddies because they have this common interest to in doing this thing together. That thing of, of playing music for people certainly can, can bond you know, human beings, certainly listener to performer, but also the set of performers that are doing things. And we tend to think of our bands usually and, you know, everything's great. It's wonderful. Can't wait to see those guys. But I was thinking about when there have to be difficult conversations, when there has to be, you know, when you have to call somebody out and the styles and tact and message would have to go along with that. And for me, in my 10 piece band, I have a mantra. Everybody does the same work. And that means we're all in this. We're all, you know, we're all putting in the same effort. It's a team effort. It's a team. And, you know, we're going to, we're going to succeed as a team. And when someone doesn't put in the same work, I have a variety of tacks by which I 
coax, <laughs> mm-hmm. coax good behavior, coax someone back onto the track there. You know, again, I have my style and there are different management styles, all these types of things. But I'm just kind of curious, have you, have you ever been the target or a fly on the wall or a participant or the, or the message deliverer in a tough band conversation? Uh, yes to all of those. Mm. Um, yeah, well, y- yeah, because I mean, it, it happens to all of us. You're, you're either the one, if a band is not in sync in terms of the amount of, of effort being put in by each person, um, and, and, and really the amount of, uh, you know, product outcome being delivered by each person, there's at some point there's bound to be frustration, right? I mean, if that, that, that gap starts to widen to the point where one person is holding the band back, that mm. that's that that's a problem. So, yeah, I have been part of this um, early in my life. Not that early. I'd been playing in bands. Uh, I think I was just out of high school and uh, there was I was actually going to pick up my girlfriend who was still in high school uh, from a uh, pre uh, it was a, a marching band rehearsal at her high school. She was on the other side of town for me. So she um, it was a different band director. And but I knew this guy because I had just graduated from the other school and and we had met and, and everything. And this guy was a real hard ass. I mean, like and and that band did was bigger than ours and and played at a different level than ours. And uh, and so I went to pick her up and he didn't mind that I came into the room because we kind of knew each other. And it was the end of rehearsal. And this was before school started. They called it band camp. But really, it was just, you know, every evening for two weeks before school started because they had to be ready for marching season and football season, which started kind of right away. And uh, and so we were there and I remember him calling this freshman sax player out and he, he knew that this kid didn't know his part. And he made the kids stand up. Um, you know, and there's uh, there were, you know, 100 people in this band, maybe maybe if maybe 120. And he made this kid stand up and he's like, all right, play your part for whatever song it, it was. And the kid was like froze, you know, yeah. and everybody in the room. And of course, I, you know, I can't say anything, but he, he went over the top with this kid. I mean, he went way too far. It was when I saw the movie Whiplash, I actually had to go and check to see if it was about this guy because it was really that kind of just vicious attack. And, uh, and he made this kid like fumble through, you know, at least a couple of notes. I mean, the kid just didn't know his part. And, and, and the point the guy was trying to make was, was valid. The way he made it to me was way too, way too harsh, especially for a kid. But you know, the point was if this guy doesn't know his music or if any of us don't know our music, we're not going to be able to play at the level that we want, even though we've got people in here that, that do know their music and everybody needs to deliver. It was exactly your point. So I've been very sensitive since that moment. It really stuck with me uh, watching this and, and not being able to really do anything about it. I mean, it wasn't like he was beating the kid or anything where I f- felt like, OK, it doesn't matter. I got to step in, you know, and it was like, OK, this is how you run your band, man. Like, mm. but let's start. Let's start this. Let me just so, pause right there. Yeah. So was it effective? I don't know, but I would I, I don't know if in that particular instance it was effective, but in a general sense, I, I would have to say yes. I mean, the results that he got were were good results. So, yes, it, in a general sense, yes, it was effective. Yeah. So there's three dynamics here. There's the management style. Yep. There's the particular person that you're trying to get the message. You know, are they do they have the ability to hear it? Right. And then there's the effect of the team altogether. So there's three kind of things you got to kind of consider. And I think, you know, the smart leader will consider all three of those things. Yeah. Be very cognizant that there's a tact to take. Uh, be very cognizant that uh, at the end of the day, your goal is to get everybody playing. And, you know, to some degree you want to, like I said, I try to coax when I'm feeling like someone's, you know, veering off, I, I try to coax them back on with positive reinforcement, but that doesn't always work. And I know that. And so, right. you know, th- there's all, there's those three kind of, you know, moving lines that yeah. you're trying to line up. Yeah. Ultimately you want, you want to, you want a, a success, you, you know, you want a result that, that will work in things. And I'm, I'm actually, I'm asking if that I'm hearing you kind of cringe as you're telling the story. 
And funny enough, um, many of my horns were in hardcore uh, uh, drum corps yeah. life. Yeah. Um, my, my bass player was previously a trumpet player in uh, hardcore drum corps life. Uh, and he said, that that's kind of the way you do it. Like, this is a real thing. Um, one person is not going to hold us back. We're not going to let that happen. We're not going to coddle that. Yep. And so calling someone out saying, play your part, bar 16 through 20, you know, and just boom, uh, is seems to be seems to be the tact like you are accountable is. you can't yeah. hide behind your band no you, right exactly you're you're even though there's 119 other people here and you're number 120 you are not going to hide behind any one of them you are this here. someone makes sense to me no because- it does it was like i said it, it I'm, it's not necessarily the the concept in a general sense that i'm against it was it was his particular implementation of it on that night made me like it was like whoa this is it's uncomfortable I mean, this is, well this and this was a you know 13 14 year old kid it yeah. wasn't a 22 year old in a drum corps right i mean it it was a whole it, it was like yeah okay like I I'm with you, buddy. And I'm with you also that you're teaching all 119 of people that are watching to never show up unprepared. Heaven forbid yeah, yeah. you call them out. Right. I mean, this was right. a lesson to everyone for sure, but it, he just like, he went to, uh, in my mind, it was just it, at that moment. It was like, yeah, dude, he went too far in his direct tone with him or yeah. he went too far that the tact was not cool. No, the tone was too, not cool. too menacing, too menacing. Yeah, exactly. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. And he had a reputation right, for this. So this, this wasn't, this wasn't a surprise to me, but it was the first time I had seen it. It's like, oh, yeah, right. holy crap. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I, and again, I think as a leader, this is kind of my message. A, everyone does the same work, but also. Uh, sloppiness becomes habitual. And so yeah. once you kind of let that cancer into your locker room, um, it spreads. And so that to me, again, you, you live a little bit more in a democratic band situation. I live in a little more autocratic right. uh, band situation. And this but is still, my style. Yeah, still, it's the same thing. I mean, it doesn't matter what the how the band's organized, what whatever the weakest link is will hold the band to that, like lowest common denominator. It's just how it's going to be. And it way more of the case in a five piece or 10 piece band than it is in a hundred piece band. Right. Like that. The reality is that kid probably could hide behind people and the band could still do, you know, fairly well if it was just him. But if it's just one person in your five piece or 10 piece band, well, that that's going to make a way it's a much bigger difference. So I, yeah. And I've, I've been, I've been on both sides of this conversation too. I've, I've, you know, called people out for exactly what we're talking about here. And, and I've been called out. I, I many times, um, I, especially in terms of like singing harmonies, it's like, all right, just sing your part. Yep. You know, yep. it's like, Oh yep. crap. <laughs> Okay. Yep. I really, I don't really, know I wouldn't this. put that in. I, I would put that it, it definitely. That's uncomfortable. Yep. Um, but that's not, uh, you know, it's not a whole mental error versus physical error thing. So, you know, that that's more like we need to spot check that this is right. No, because, you know, well, yes. if your preparation is not your preparation is not in question. Right. Well, no, in in, in, I, in the examples I'm sort of thinking of, it was, yes, that my preparation was in question. Uh, like I, I, I didn't know what I was supposed to be singing. I was sort of, you know, just flubbing along. And it's like, no, no, no. Like sing your part. It's like, well, I actually don't know my part. Oh. So did you react well to this? Like, 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 that's right. I'm now reminded I am accountable to these other people I'm playing music with. I have to do the same prep that they do. Is that, is, uh, is that what you walked away from those types of things with? Uh, certainly with this, you know, with distance. Yes. In the moment, I can't really say. It's uncomfortable. Yeah, of course. It sucks. Yeah. 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 No, no, absolutely. Yeah. Again, I, I draw the distinction between um, spot checking apart. That's different. Um, right. Yeah, that's different. right. Versus yep. versus illuminating the fact that someone, you know, and, and that's really what I'm talking about with these with these difficult conversations. I mean, it's all in premise. Like, is everybody putting the same amount of time into rehearsal? Is everybody putting the same amount of time into their personal woodshedding? We've had several people prep. You've you've um, shared this a few times. Rehearsal is not the place where you learn the song. No. Right. Unless, you know, unless unless you're really in a pro situation where, you know, these people are, are booked, you know, around the clock, Kate, come to the studio, we're going to put a song together and, and you do that, you know, in real time. That's one type of situation, but most of us in productive cover bands, and that's kind of where we're going to yeah. is, is yeah. the idea is, all right, we're going to learn this song this week. I would venture to guess just, just sociology being what it is. 
a measurable percent of people roll up their sleeves, go in, come in prepared. A measurable number of people know it enough figuring, well, I'll, I'll finish this at the rehearsal. Yep. And, and in that, there's a certain amount of tolerance and acceptance and a certain amount of frustration. And depending on probably what else is going on in the world, that frustration becomes a sticking point, right? Yes. It, yeah, you know, right. It, right. Right. And then sometimes, if, you know, if you're watching, it boils over like every damn week I'm doing the work in advance. Why do I? Why am I? But those people who are are pre-wired to do the work in advance, they live in a world where you know, they're probably always doing that, right? In all aspects it, of their it, life. It's they're not being just being the responsible rehearsal. citizen, right, right? Right, And that's where the frustration comes from because if you are that type of person, and, and I like to think that I, I am, um, there are times when, like, like, for example, you know, Madhouse is very much this, right? Where you got to learn a ton of tunes and show up at rehearsal prepared to get through them, right? It, it, it's the expectation that you're going to show up at rehearsal and it'd be perfect. No, but you're going to have a working knowledge of this song you're about to play. Mm-hmm. And then you got, and then you put it together, you rehearse it, you don't learn it. Right. And, but there are times and this week for sure was probably my, my worst level of preparedness for Madhouse just because with everything else going on. And that's not an excuse. It's, it, I mean, I should have, I should have spent more time two weeks ago preparing than I, you know, than I did. But there were moments like, you know, monkey business where it was like, I really should have taken a taken the time to like just describe this song better to myself in my notes because I'm not going to remember it at the gig, you know, and uh, and those kinds of things. But the problem is you have somebody that normally is prepared and we all have slips. Right. So you you show up to a band rehearsal. You didn't learn the song because whatever, you're busy at work, fought with your spouse, whatever. And now it sets the bar of like, even if you say, I know this is unacceptable. I'm sorry. Yada, yada, yada. Everybody says, oh, well, if that guy didn't prepare, I can slack right. off more. Right. It's yep. a very slippery slope. I mean, that cancer in the locker room. Cancer in the locker room. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, you know, everybody goes through life with a certain knowing what they can get by with. Right. I mean, most, most people I find there are some people who are the type A who are just on it. Most people know the minimum they can do and still be passable. Yeah. You learn right? what corners to cut. That's, that's life. exactly. Yeah. 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 But I, th- I do think, again, this is the culture of your band. This is the personality of your leader. What is the expectation? And that, that thing that people have been posting on our, on our Facebook page about, you know, the expectation is you learn your parts and then we run the song at rehearsal. We don't yep. learn the song unless it, unless your band is, we learn the song together at rehearsal, but then give everybody the opportunity. And then you, you know, you've at least communicated to the type A's. If you choose to do the work in advance, good for you. Thank you. But you know, that that's not really what's going to happen here. Yep. I guess, you know, at the end it's a communication uh, clarification. Yeah. With fling, we've, we've developed an interesting uh, dynamic and it it's not it would not have been my first choice but it works uh, because we had people we would say oh we should try this song and then you know three of us would learn it and and two of us wouldn't or two of us would learn it and three of us wouldn't and it would be this frustrating like well we can't really play it unless everybody actually knows the tune so, yeah. so we've gotten to the point where we we sort of vet songs together where we'll listen to it uh, in the studio, we'll be like, oh, yeah, wouldn't it be a good idea to do that tune? Great. Yeah, OK, listen to it a little bit. We'll have the chords somehow, you know, we'll pull them up or whatever. And then we uh, and then we just fake our way through it with everyone at the I we all know no one prepared level. Now, somebody might just know the song better than than others. And that's fine. But there's no frustration about preparedness. And we play it. And and then it's OK. This is this is workable. Let's all go home and learn it. And then next rehearsal, we will play it. And that works well uh, for us. And it's very it's very efficient. Like we can we can suss a tune. We can listen and suss a tune out in 10 minutes or less. It's like, OK, great. Now we know it, it, it'll it work. Now let's go learn it and come back next week and, and nail it. And then we and then we do. And it, it generally tends to work out all right. Yeah. Whatever process works for you, as long as it's communicated clearly. That's it. And, and it's, it's when the process is violated, um, that's when those difficult conversations happen. And so that tact, I think, that we've discussed, you know, that's that's useful for me. I, I, I actually, you don't have to be menacing about it, but I do think the thing is like, if you set a culture like, hey, you know, I, I would call at any moment to ask anybody in the band, play your part and don't be that guy. Yeah. Don't be that guy. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, right. You don't want to be the one holding things up because it's it's not um, 
it, 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 it just isn't, it's not good for the overall vibe. You, you, you want your band to just have fun playing together. I mean, that's really that's the it. goal. It's it. And it's mutual. It's mutual respect is really what it comes down to. in in my book, cool. yeah. Yeah. Well, that was fun. You got anything else, man? Or are we, uh, are we on our way out here? It's, it's all off my chest now. Okay. Well, that's good. <laughs> that's, that's why we all, we all assemble here, Paul, because we want to, we want to take your therapy. Uh, it's, it's therapy. <laughs> that's right, man. <laughs> All right. Well, we started the episode with uh, with me making myself laugh. We ended the episode with Paul making us all laugh. So there we go. There we go. Yep, it's good. Um, Hey, have a good Memorial Day weekend. Hope you have a lot of fun. I got a lot of gigs ahead, so I'll have some good stories next week. Yeah, yeah, we'll have some. uh, I I I will be. uh, My my life has gotten easier because all I have to do is go play these grease gigs. I don't need to grease, 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 grease. That's right. Grease is the word. That's what they say, but we don't play that song. So there you go. Uh. (laughs) Take it easy. Always be performing, folks. We'll see you next week.